Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Daugherty, and this is Simon Knight. And we're both with the viral uh, engineering team. And we're here to talk to you about uh, what viral is and some of the use cases that uh, people are using viral for today and some that we envision in the future. So how, just so we get a sense, how many people are actively using viral? Okay, not too many, good, because this is really targeted at teaching people what viral is and talking a little bit about how to use it. So Simon's going to do the, uh, the first half, and then I'm going to do a demo and then talk a little bit about the use cases. Very good. So thanks for coming. Yeah, so as Brian outlined, we're going to start with just a brief <laughs> overview of what viral is, run through the overview of the components and the architecture. Brian's going to give a demonstration of just some of the basic use casing uh, we're using it. Uh, we're going to run through some use cases showing the, the real versatility and a little bit on some APIs at the end. <coughs> so we'll start with just explaining what Viral is. So Viral is the virtual internet routing lab. It's a <coughs> network orchestration and virtualization platform. And what we're allowing you to do is to design a network to configure it automatically for various use cases to be able to visualize the configurations that are run and to see the uh, running simulation and validating the changes there and interacting with the devices like they're real. And that's what differentiates it from some other simulation platforms. And then also the ability to connect it to live networks and interact between hardware and virtual equipment. And as part of DevNet, you can use that because it's the, uh, the realness to integrate it with other DevOps tools, whether that's APIs or controllers. So we're talking about some of the why viral is important or why it's useful for various network engineering tasks. So as we can see here, it's pretty important or useful for quite a variety of uh, engineering. So we've seen people using it as students and teaching in university scenarios or in learning things like the Cisco uh, CCNA, CCIE or CCNP. We've seen network operators using it to test their networks before they uh, implement changes, engineering for the similar tasks, and application developers such as in DevNet. And what we're really looking for is something that allows people to quickly build an environment for testing and development, and making that easy to use, easy to configure, easy to scale out, and able to be repeatable, which is quite important for change validation. And then also making it portable, which is really important being able to share with the team and inexpensive because buying equivalent hardware gear would be quite expensive to set up a lab. So we'll just run through a brief overview of the architecture of how Viral is set up. So what we do is we get a number of the reference platforms that would normally be run on real routers or other network operating systems and make them run as virtual machines. So as we can see here, there's quite a variety of platforms. We've got the iOS for the iOS Classic, a Layer 2 version that allows some switching and VLAN capabilities. We've got the XR for the, uh, or the ISR, IS, iOS XRV to prov provide the XR syntax, NXOS with some of the data center features, and the CSR 1000V for the iOS XE syntax. As well as that, we've got other servers as well. We've got the ASA for the firewall, and then servers to provide application layer functionality. We also have some other appliances in there, like the traffic generators, which can be combined to create quite powerful network scenarios. And then third-party appliances can also be integrated. The important thing to note here is that the virtualized platforms aren't actually representing a specific hardware platform. So we don't have things like the fans, the switch fabric, or the ASIC models. So when we're looking at things like control plane routing policy, it's very close to the real network image, which is really powerful for being able to do change validation and learning. When it comes to some of the more advanced features with hardware, especially in things like the NXOS, those capabilities aren't all there yet today. So for some use cases, it's very powerful. For some others, it's still a work in progress. I think your mic's up. This rendering problem, but that doesn't mean we don't do those things. That just. <laughs> <laughs> it's a font rendering issue. It's not yeah. that they're not present in the product today. So in terms of viral itself, we're running things through a hypervisor, such as KVM. We have Viral running as a Ubuntu virtual machine, and then the virtual machines running inside of that, and that's what we're showing here. So we're running instead of the, the physical equipment, running the routers as virtual machines. We've built it on top of OpenStack, which allows a lot of the orchestration and other <laughs> functionality from there. 
One of the important things here is that because we're using KVM and virtualization, it's not just restricted to the images that we provide. So other people have been able to run other server images, Windows virtual machines. If you've got certain um, security appliances or controllers, you can also integrate them. And other people have integrated third-party virtual machines from other network operating uh, networks providers. So it's not just limited to the Cisco devices because real networks can be a combination of Cisco equipment and other equipment, they can be integrated here together and create a more realistic scenario and do some ch change validation and testing there. And we're also looking at other alternative architectures. So at the moment, we've got OpenStack. We're also looking at other alternatives that might be allowing for greater scale or for lighter resource usage for different um, portability requirements. So one of the things that we've built on top of the OpenStack and the simulation layer is trying to make it scalable and easy to use. So we've got the user interface, which we're showing here, which is via Maestro. The idea is that over on the left-hand side, you get a list of the images and the devices that you want to simulate. You can then drag and drop them in, wire them together, and then start up a topology. So the aim is to make it very simple to draw a network. And it's not just limited to the networks that are provided here. You could draw that to match your um, production network or to a certain uh, studying requirement and, and it's flexible in that regard. And so VM Maestro provides the ability to design the networks. It's got functionality to manage the running simulation and also then to connect into the consoles and interact like with them like it'd be a real network device. We also have an alternative user interface for different requirements. So we've got a browser-based editor which allows to draw the network topology and do many of those design functions in a browser depending on the scenario. So rather than having a desktop client, you can quickly edit them in a browser. One of the features that we've got is Auto NetKit. And the idea here is that when you've drawn a basic network, rather than sitting there and configuring all of the point-to-point -point subnets, all the routing protocols, and all of the base configurations just to be able to do some more high-level experimentation, what we've created here is a feature that automatically builds a bootstrap configuration. So that would do IPv4 addressing, IPv6 addressing, configure routing protocols like BGP, ISIS, OSPF, um, and MPLS. And that way, depending on what the scenario is, so for certain basic study, it's probably better to start from scratch. If you're wanting to do some advanced routing policy, being able to quickly draw a network, add some basic parameters such as the autonomous system number, click configuration, and then have, as we can see here, the configuration automatically generated can save <coughs> 30 minutes an hour and get people to uh, operate or study the feature they're interested in. In a dev DevOps or developer environment, that's really powerful because you don't need to spend time coming up with a specific golden topology. You can quickly draw it, have it ready, and then start interacting through an API or studying it through a controller. So that can save a lot of time and allows really rapid assessment of different topologies, debugging and making it easy to vary the topology and see how it interacts with a uh, software system. So the topologies themselves are stored as an XML file. That allows it to be human readable. So we can see the, I don't think we've got it in this screenshot, but the configuration's embedded there as well. So you can just open a text edit and modify it there. It can also be then passed through something like Python and modified, so it makes it easy to use it not just within the tools that we provide, but also through third-party tools or importing from other topologies into creating the viral topology. And another important feature is actually then shareable, so it can be pushed onto GitHub or emailed to a colleague and shared around like that. We've had some network consultants who have been preparing the topology themselves and then emailing it to the client and using that to be able to share a demonstration and do a proof of concept in that way. So in terms of the viral system itself, we've got OpenStack sitting at the bottom running the virtual machines. Above that, we've got our core piece, which is the services topology director. The main feature of this is the interface between the low-level OpenStack simulation and the higher-level tools. And this presents an API that the user interface uses or that can be directly interacted with by the user, which Brian will be covering later on. And it's operate, yeah. So. We've also got the user workspace management piece. So this is providing a browser-based uh, interface to doing the server configuration tasks. So rather than interacting at the low level through Linux, it provides a high level to be able to do server administration and also working with the simulation. So the ability to start and stop the nodes, starting and stopping the interfaces on them, setting link parameters, and some of the other features we'll cover later on in the various use cases. So this can all be done through a web browser
So we'll just run through a basic workflow of how the design case would work. So we first of all, start with drawing up the topology in the editor like VM Maestro. We can then optionally use Auto Netkit to generate the configurations. It's not a requirement. You can just type them in manually into the editor and, and then launch it from there. Or we can set the parameters, click the button, and get our configurations built for us automatically. Or configure the, build the basic automatic configurations and then edit them depending on the use case and save that to the XML file. As part of the automatic configuration, we also show the topologies being generated. So here we can see a number of autonomous systems. So that's a quick way to see what's being automatically generated rather than needing to read through multiple configurations to see if that matches what the intention was. And then we can see the configurations in step four, which are then being automatically configured, which we can then edit or then launch directly. Once we're happy with the topology design and configurations that we've set up, we can then send that off to the service topology director which will then send that off to OpenStack and launch the virtual machines and create the links between them. So now we'll have a running network that we can interact with. And that's what we can see here with a Telnet session that's exposed. So we can just Telnet in, either using the integrated Telnet client or using something like Secure CRT, and it will look like a real router and using all our normal iOS commands there. So once we've launched the simulation, there's a number of aspects that we provide to make it easier to interact with and provide some functionality. One of these is the active canvas part of VM Maestro. So this shows the nodes that are running. We can see them with a green outline around them indicating that they're up and running. We can also get the live status of the nodes showing there and also of the links. So we can take the links up and down and see how the network behaves. We've got one example where people are using that for an iWAN scenario, taking links up and down and seeing how the network then automatically adjusts. And then we can also access the node and link properties to vary other parameters there. So this is a quick heads up view across the running network. We can log into the devices. So we've got a number of options there. One is through bridging them out across the uh, shared interface. We can also access the console port. And these are exposed through VM Maestro, like I mentioned before, either directly through the Telnet there, or that can then just right click on the node and launch into something like Secure CRT and interact from it through that method. Through the interface, we can also start and stop the nodes themselves. This can be useful to see how a, no a network will behave with changes occurring. And we can also, for larger simulations, start them sequentially. So you only start a, a fraction of that, and then start a larger portion if uh, to, to work with server requirements. And one of the more powerful situations is both simulating the link and interface failures. So we can click on a link and take that up or down or start and stop an interface. And as we can also see here down the bottom, there's the ability to do packet captures integrated. So when we start combining the things like taking links up and down, packet captures, sending traffic across the network, and create some really powerful scenarios that would be fairly difficult to do in a real hardware environment. So the virtualized environment can offer new features much more simply than even if we had the, the expense or the size to be able to replicate the network in hardware. So there's some features offered through virtualization that would be very difficult to do in a hardware environment. And those packet captures can either be stored to a file to review later on, or it's fed out to something like Wireshark to see the real traffic running automatically across the network. And then we've got the other ability to simulate real world conditions. So we can do things like adding latency between a link to make it maybe one second, five seconds, a couple of hundred milliseconds and see how the network behaves and inserting jitter and dropping packets. And this is what people were using with the IWAN scenario to really modify the network parameters and see how a controller or the network itself would operate and behave and react to those changes. One of the other features we've got is once you've logged into the devices through Telnet or Secure CRT or other methods, you can make changes to the configuration just using conf t. And then we provide the ability to log into each of those devices. It pulls the configs back automatically and saves them back to that XML file. So then you can shut down the simulation, pass it to a colleague, put it into Git, or launch it again the next day. So they got the ability to store it back into that file and then to resume it later on. And one of the final features we've got is a live visualization. So what we're doing here is logging to each of the devices, getting to various features like the routing table, the BGP network, the OSPF adjacencies, and then visualizing them here. So what we can see is the, this one is uh, BGP. So it's showing the route reflector 
at the edge of each of these networks, the various autonomous systems, and showing the adjacencies in real time. So we could then log into one of those devices, <coughs> take down the BGP session or take down the IGP and see the change showing here. We could run a trace route through the network and see the path changing. If we combine this with the features we had before, such as the taking a link up or down or taking a node up or down, we could then visually see quickly what's happening with the network. And then that will allow us to, to know where to log in and see what's changed and get the features like that. So it's a quick heads up view across the various changes across the network. And especially with larger networks or when we're doing things like device programmability, being able to visualize the changes very quickly and easy makes it quite, quite fast to iterate through and to see the changes. So now Brian will give a quick demonstration of some of these features that we've covered. Okay, thanks Simon. I suppose uh, some of that's gonna be quite difficult for even people in the front row to see because of the scale. Um, but what I'm going to do is go through a demonstration of how to use viral, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the use cases. Now, when I was over there, I couldn't really hear Simon very well. You guys can all hear okay? I don't have to talk real loud. Okay, so VM Maestro, as Simon described, is the front-end tool to, um, to the viral system, one of the front-end tools. And it's a client-server architecture, so I'm running VM Maestro locally on my laptop. The server that I'm talking to is actually in Amsterdam. So what we're going to do is we're going to de um, define the network, send it to that server in Amsterdam, and then be able to uh, interact with it there. So VM Maestro uh, is what most people use today. It was the first tool. And you have a canvas in the middle where you can paint your topology. You have a set of nodes that you can select from. Uh, for those of you that can't read some of that text, we have things like the ASAV uh, firewall, um, IO, uh, iOS XRV routers, so the service provider routers. We have iOS V, which runs on things like the UBRs and some of the older um, campus platforms. A number of different LXCs. Some of these LXCs uh, are actually appliances that do things like route generation, um, the Austin Auto packet generator drone, uh, and uh, others are just plain LXCs you can fire up and, and do what you want with. We also have uh, uh, switches, unmanaged and managed, with uh, iOS L2. And we have servers. You can have any number of different servers. The one that we package with the system is an Ubuntu uh, 16.04. So you have a number of things to select to, to build your network with. You also have uh, some others that, that um, describe uh, external networks that you can connect to viral. One of the nice things about Viral is from the host itself, when you spin up a simulation, you can connect that simulation to an interface on the host and then out to a network. So you can actually have a simulation connected to a real live network. And as far as either one is concerned, um, they're both real. They're going to interact with each other uh, as if they're real. You have a context sensitive properties pane. So this pane down here changes based on what it is that you have in focus in the canvas. Uh, some of this stuff over here is not important for us today. And then you also have a simulation view that shows you active and running simulations. So to build a network, what I'm going to do is build a network that's commonly used to assess skills for people doing the CCNA uh, tests and certification tracks. I'm just going to use iOS V today because iOS V is one of our smallest virtual machines. It, it boots up fairly quickly. It ha doesn't have a, a great deal of... Um, uh, demand on the resources. Some of these others, specifically like iOS XRV or NXOS V9000, are quite large. They take a fair amount of time to boot, um, so I'm not going to try to use those today. So this is a pick and click interface, not a drag and drop. Um, some people that have used GNS3 in the past tend to want to like grab these and try to pull them out onto the canvas, but you just pick the one you want and you just drop onto the canvas I'm going to build the network uh, that you saw earlier on some of Simon's slides. So I'm just going to drop a bunch of these on. Then I'm going to take my connect tool and you just start, you click where you want to start, you click where you want to end. And I'm just going to build a little triple triad here. Normally we would name these, but I don't want to take the time to 
to put the names in. And once you've built your network, you can drag things around, organize it um, how you wish. And when I click out on the canvas, remember I mentioned that this is uh, context sensitive properties. So one of the things that I can do just for the topology as a whole is I can set things like the address spaces that I want to use, whether or not I want the, the network to be IPv4 or IPv6 or dual stack. Let's just go with dual stack today. We have a number of defaults. So for example, the, the router IDs that are generated as part of the configurations, um, we can set the um, address space that we want to use for that. We can set the address space that we want to use for the intervening links and so on. And Auto Netkit, which Simon uh, wrote, by the way, was uh, takes all that information and builds the topology on your behalf. So I've got my network looking how I want it. I can now begin to set up properties for the specific nodes on this, this triad. So I'm going to make a, a 3AS wide area network. Let's just say that you know, one of these is Middle East, one of these is US, one of these is Europe. So I can, set, I can drag around the three on the left. I'm going to set those in ASN1. And I'm going to set a route, rec, uh, route cluster ID as well. That'll be important later. And I can do that for the others. Before I move on, though, I want to point out that one of the things that I have the ability to do is select the routing protocol that I want to have run in that specific ASN. So the default is OSPF, but I'll just select it here. And then I'm going to move on to my next autonomous system. Let's make that 20. And maybe here we have some holdouts that are still running EIGRP. And over here, because it's Europe, and they like all things standardized, we'll run IS. IS over here. OK, so I've defined three ASNs. I've defined the routing protocols that I want to run in those. Now I'm going to do a little bit more. I'm going to set all of the nodes that are furthest from the core, which I can just select by doing Shift and click. I want to make all these guys route reflectors. I'm sorry, route reflector clients. And then all of my WAN routers, I'm going to make route reflectors. OK, so I've defined my 3ASN network. Um, but if I look at any one of these routers, I don't have any configurations yet. Now, you don't have to use Auto Netkit to generate configurations. You can if you feel like it. You can type a configuration in right here. That will be sent to the router when it's started. Um, you could start the network now with no configurations and then connect to the routers and, and do everything by, by hand. Uh, or we can use Auto Netkit just to generate all those configurations. So there's a little button up here that's kind of hard to see. And when we click it, it takes the description, the XML description of our network, um, along with um, the properties that we've set, sends it to Auto Netkit. Auto Netkit's going to look at that, generate the configurations and the visualizations on our behalf. And what, this window pops up, and it's basically the XML representation of our network. But we can see that on the right-hand side, it has inserted the configurations that describe the network we want. The next thing we're going to see is the visualizations that AutoNet get created. Takes a moment because it's it's remote and the Wi-Fi is not so super in here. So we have a number of different views. Uh, this is the physical view of our network, and you can see that it's gray. It's provided gray indications of our ASNs, but we can look at other things. For example, the OSPF topology, which we only see in one place. Uh, EIGRP, which hopefully we only see in one place, and same for ISIS. Of course, uh, in a more sophisticated network, these, these drawings can be, uh, be more valuable. But one of the things that I like the visualizations for is it really helps you to see visually um, that you've configured your network correctly. Sometimes it's not so easy to see from the configurations. So for example, if I look at the IBGP configuration, I can see that I did it right, um, or Auto Netkit did it right, uh, because I do not have a full mesh within each one of these ASNs. Each one of the route reflector clients is, is talking to the route reflector. 
And then if I look at the eBGP, I should only see connections existing between those three ASNs. Okay, so I've built my network, I've configured my network. The next thing we want to do is actually start a simulation of this. So I'm going to click the Go button. It's going to take that and send it to our back end in Amsterdam. And these nodes are going to go through a number of different phases. Um, the first thing they're going to show up is absent. That just means that the services topology director knows that they're there. It's going to now take the time to make the OpenStack calls to instantiate KVM virtual machines for each one of these images. So as they, um, as they go through that process, we'll see them go from absent to building to active unreachable and then active reachable. And what active reachable means is that this little LXC container that we spin up as part of a simulation can see all of the routers in our, in our network. And, and this uh, management LXC plays a key role in our ability to manage and, uh, and interact with those devices. So we see them coming up. It's a fairly stout machine, so they're coming up fairly quickly. So we've gone from uh, absent to, to building to active. And they're probably all up and running right now. There's a little refresh button up here. And we can also see on our live, our, our active canvas, that as the state changes for each one of these elements in our network, they go from blue to green. And we can see that our links are actually coming up and so on. OK, so our network is up. Now, active does not mean that my network is completely built and everything's converged and everything's happy in the network. That just means that all of the KVM virtual machines that describe this network are booted. They'll be busy uh, booting the iOS software and getting themselves sorted. So let me see. I'm going to go to iOS 7. And once they're active, we can tell net to the console. And we'll be able to see, OK, so that one's booted already. So at this point, it's just as if you took your laptop into a lab and you plugged the console cable in into that router. So we can do things like um, go enable mode. The password on these are always Cisco. And do what you might normally do when you're trying to assess the state of a network. We can do show IP route and see the routing table. We can do. Um, this one doesn't have OSPF on it, but we should have IP BGP sessions. They're probably not up yet. Uh, we can do uh, show IP BGP neighbor or summary. And uh, in fact, we do have connections already to our reflector, route reflector clients and the other ASs. Now, one neat thing about working with, with Viral is you might ask, OK, so I've got a network up. It's running. It's not real hardware. What happens when I change the configuration and I want to be able to go back to that network in that state? Well, we can do things like modify the configuration on the router and do things like, let's just do something simple, like change the host name. Berlin. I'll do a right mem. It doesn't actually do anything, but I'm just used to it. Oh, what did I do here? Unless they've actually taken, no, they, they left it in there. Good. OK. So I've gone in. I've, I've been able to touch a router. Let's just go over here and look at another one. And this, this uh, ASN is running OSPF, so we can do things like show IP OSPF neighbor and see that we have peers. We can ping. Um, the, the data plane in Viral is Ethernet. So it's basically all being managed by the CPU on the host. It goes through OpenStack, subnets, and Linux Bridge is the underlying um, data transport. So we should be able to ping one of our neighbors. Got a little bit of delay there. And it's just like you've got connectivity, real connectivity between these routers. <coughs> OK, so now I've, I've established that my network's up and running. I can do things like turn nodes off. So I can send a command and say, I'm, it's like I went and somebody tripped over the power cable to my router. I can go and I can look at individual links, and I can 
modify the link parameters. So for example, say I want to add um, 100 milliseconds of latency on that link, and it's a bad link, uh, it's going across the bottom of the ocean, somebody drug an anchor across it, and we've got 50% you know, packet loss. So once we've done that, it'll, show, it'll give a little uh, decoration here to say that we've done a modification on that link. And then finally, we can go and really break our network and unplug an interface. Now, I'm not going to go through packet captures because we just don't have enough time for that. But you can see that we are very quickly able to get a network up and running and manipulate and interact with it. Now, if you were um, trying to do this you know, four years ago before viral, I mean, you'd have to have a, a stack of routers, and it would probably take you, even if you're pretty good, uh, most of the morning to get this up and running. So the final thing I'm going to show you, now that we've built our network and messed with it a little bit, we can also extract the configurations. So since I made a change, I believe it was on iOS 7, Sorry, wouldn't be a demo without a little bit of a problem. What's it want me to do, save? Okay, so what it's doing is it's pulling the, it's pulling the configs the management LXC went and spoke to each one of those routers. I'm not sure what it wants here. I guess I didn't save it in a folder that it liked. Uh, so the management LXC went and spoke to all the routers, got the configs, pulled it back, and has placed it in the XML representation of our network. So the next time you start it, it's going to have that information. So let's go ahead and stop. And I'll switch back to the design view. And if we look in the configuration file, my extraction failed. <laughs> Yay, first demo demon of the day. Um, if, uh, just trust me though, when it's normally working right, you'll see all the configuration changes in, the, uh, in that file. Okay, so that's a, a quick and dirty on how to, uh, how to use viral. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the potential use cases and where, where people are using this and where people like to use this in their networks. So the first I already talked about a little bit, uh, uh, CC, any of the Cisco certifications, we're beginning to see viral be used uh, very aggressively both as a teaching tool um, and as an assessment tool uh, in these environments. Uh, we have uh, network academies, the, almost everything you'll see over at Cisco Learning, you'll see viral woven into uh, their, their teaching and assessment products. Instructor-led training, um, I don't know, many of you may have encountered going to somebody, some place like Pearson View or a local university where they're trying to teach people early in career networking technologies and so on. And in the past, they had to have real equipment. And they couldn't have that much of it because it's expensive. They couldn't share it very well amongst their students. But now with viral, every person, every one of you could be sitting here with your own viral environment running on your laptop. And you could, um, you could interact with networks of varying degree of sophistication and so on and do it very easily and at a very uh, inexpensive cost. So demonstrations, uh, down at the learning labs on the other end, many of the demonstrations that are around the little train that they have going down there for IoT is, are, are based on viral. We have, uh, some of you may have used dCloud, which is Cisco's uh, cloud demonstration environment. Many of those are using viral today. So if you're a customer though, a small business or an enterprise customer that wants to be able to assess new features. Viral is a great tool for that because we have iOS, we have XR, we have NXOSV. Oftentimes, we'll release a new version of the software and a customer may want to be able to assess how would I configure it, um, get to know it, how, make sure they understand it before they deploy it in their network as a whole. 
instead of getting a new piece of equipment or setting aside a piece of equipment in order to test that feature, they can just do it uh, with viral. So troubleshooting, uh, a lot of times we'll see our own TAC using viral to try to assess what they're seeing in a customer network rather than getting the equipment again uh, because the equipment's expensive and difficult to configure they can just use viral to spin up a network and I should mention uh, that uh, the the virtual machines that we're running as part of viral uh, they make no attempt to represent underlying hardware it's the control plane and management plane functionality and the uh, Ethernet um, shims that allow it to be used on top of OpenStack, but there's not the concept of like a blade. It doesn't show you fans or power supplies or things like that, and it, it's not like an iOS, uh, I'm sorry, an ASR 9000 versus a CRS1. It's just the management and control plane functionality. But it's built from the same source code that we use when we build our platforms. So if there's a bug on your ASR 9K, and that same bug is going to be present in, in viral. You might say, well, that sounds like a bad thing. I don't want bugs you know, all over the place. But it's good because you can test that code in viral and have uh, good confidence that if it behaves one way in viral, it's going to behave the same way on your platform. So DevOps automation testing. So we're in DevNet. DevNet's main uh, mission in life is to get people to be programming uh, with, with SDN and programming against uh, infrastructures like networks or IoT and so on. But oftentimes, a developer might be sitting somewhere and he's written a new piece of code and he wants to see what the behavior is on a real network. Well, oftentimes you don't have a real network to test against. If you do, it takes a while to spin up. With viral, they can send that new code to an automation engine like Jenkins. Jenkins can say, hey, I see new code. I'm going to take that, I'm going to use the APIs, I'm going to spin up a viral network, I'm going to test that new code against that new network, get the results, send it back to the developer, and he can learn fairly quickly whether or not the code that he's written is, uh, is useful or disastrous. So um, scale and integration testing. I mentioned earlier that you can take viral and from the host itself use the um, Ethernet interfaces to connect out to the real world. One of the ways that we've seen people use this is they'll get a new piece of equipment. Say we introduce a new um, platform like uh, a Nexus uh, 9396 or something. And they want to see how it behaves with the complex uh, routing topology that they might have in their real network. One of the things they can do is they can take that physical piece of equipment and they can connect the interfaces out to two viral simulations. And those viral simulations can generate what appears to be the rest of their real network and as far as that piece of equipment is concerned, it's sitting, it's sitting inside somebody's data center or somebody's backbone. And then you can begin to assess its performance under real, what, you know, real circumstances as far as the device is concerned. Another area, skills validation. We've seen people using viral to assess somebody coming in maybe earlier in career. And you need, uh, you need a certain skill set in terms of, you say you're a CCNA, well, let's, let, let me, let's see your chops. Put you in front of a viral simulation and um, ask them to do things and see how they do. It's uh, easier than turning them loose on your, uh, your real network. And for certifications, this little fella here looks pretty scared. I don't think he's ready. Um, but uh, you, you can use it to assess whether or not you're ready to do your CCNA or CCIE. And then familiarization. I may have covered this a little bit uh, a moment ago, but a lot of times people will hire a new, uh, a new hire into their organization, say a, a network operations center or something like that. Viral is a great way to mock up the real network that they're going to be responsible for so that they can begin to poke around and see how the protocols interact with each other and so on. Okay, so we talked about how to use viral, some of the key viral use cases. We hear about new ones all the time. So as far as getting viral, um, viral.cisco.com, pretty easy to remember. You can go there and get information about how to purchase it. You can learn viral. There's a, an address here, um, getviral.info, and that'll point you to the installation and documentation site where there's um, 
a number of tutorials on how to install it on top of ESXi, how to install it on top of uh, your uh, host-based hypervisor like Fusion. And then uh, the, the, we have a good, uh, rich learning community on uh, learningnetwork.cisco.com. And we also have uh, a GitHub site where people can share topologies and, and um, make suggestions on how to improve viral code and so on. So what kind of questions uh, can we answer for you? Hopefully I'll be able to hear you. It's quite loud up here. No questions? One in the back. Can't hear a word. So source fire? OK, um, so we do have a number of VNFs available today. I already mentioned uh, ASAV. Uh, we've got uh, an LXC environment that's pretty rich. The, the, so the question was, if uh, I sort of repeated it on, I'm sorry, was uh, what about SourceFire IPS? Um, because Viral is an environment that's based on OpenStack, if you can find a virtualized image of something, or a, li or a Linux container, or a Linux server, you can instantiate that in Viral and then use that server just like you might if it were a physical server. So if you can get the SourceFire IPS code and, and install it on a uh, virtual server inside of Viral, you could use it. Now the question is, do you have enough resources to do that? Um, Auto NetKit, of course, doesn't have any knowledge about how to configure it, so you're kind of on your own. But once you've built your network and brought it up and have that server sitting there, you can manage it and install whatever software you like. Any other questions? I'm yes, uh, the, the question is, uh, what about the resource requirements per instance? So IOSV um, requires about 512 megabytes of memory, so it's fairly small, one CPU. Every, all of our VMs run on one virtual CPU, with the exception of NX OSV 9K, which requires two. A good rule of thumb is that if it's IOSV, it's about 512 megabytes per instance. If it's any of the others, figure about three gigabytes per instance. So XRV, CSR 1KV, um, and, uh, and the others. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a straight multiplier, because KVM is, uh, is a pretty rich hypervisor, and it does a pretty good job of memory mapping, over, overlaying the memory of different virtual machines where that memory doesn't change. So as you add more and more, it's not just like a three, six, nine, and so on. So, but as a good rule of thumb, just figure two and a half to three gig per VM. No, it, the, the question is, um, with vCPUs, so, um, vCPUs are, are a little bit of a, a dark art, um, but like my MacBook um, is uh, four core, so it has eight vCPUs that it exposes to the hypervisor. The hypervisors do a pretty good job of taking those eight vCPUs and making them look like more to the guests. Um, but when I talk about assigning a vCPU to a specific virtual machine, um, I don't mean that if you have eight, you can only run eight you can probably run more because, again, these uh, host-based hypervisors do a really good job of, of mapping and allocating those resources. So on this machine, so this is a 16-gig MacBook Pro with uh, eight vCPUs, I would feel perfectly comfortable running uh, a 20-node iOS v simulation on that. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah.